Oh, I'm so grateful. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. So glad that you're here. It's been a fun uh, past couple of weeks, huh? ever since we launched Heartway 2.0, and I see we have so many new faces, and there's so much energy and momentum that we're hoping to, uh, to, to be able to utilize in order to continue to fulfill our vision of helping people discovering themselves in God and transform the world through love. And so if you're here, I want you to know that uh, you have a special place in our heart and your family. Anybody who walks through our door here at Heartway Church is family. And so we love you and want to say thank you for being here. You know, something I've noticed about human beings, particularly by watching myself and working with so many others, is that so much of the stress and the conflict that we experience within ourselves stems from one root issue. And that root issue is us forgetting who we are, us not knowing our deepest and truest identity. Now, if I were to ask anybody here, tell me who you are, tell me your identity, you'd probably be able to tell me a few things about yourself and what you do and how you conceive of yourself in this world. Because we've spent our entire lives as human beings building and creating our own identities. We build our identity on the basis of our successes and our dreams and our giftings and our passions. Others of us build our identity on things like our pain and our trauma and the things that other people have said to us and the things that uh, society has maybe programmed us to believe. This is actually what we call the ego. The ego is the identity that you build and create for yourself on the basis of your life experiences. So because you take so much time and energy to build this identity and to create this identity, you also have to take a lot of energy to maintain this identity. And so this is why we feel the deep need all the time to make sure we give off the right image to other people. We've got to make sure that other people perceive us in the right way because we've worked really hard to become this. We've worked really hard to get that degree. And so if somebody challenges our expertise, we've got to put them in their place. If somebody uh, challenges me in any way, I've got to make sure I, I, I put my foot down and let them know who I am. I've always got to be proving myself. I've always got to be putting on in front of other people. It's a heavy load and weight to carry, right? Because you've built this identity, you've created this identity, and so now you have to make sure that you maintain it. The truth is, your true identity and your deepest identity, which is a child of God and an image bearer of God, that's who you really are. That is the foundational core of your existence. Who you really are is not an identity that you build. That's an identity that you receive. It's not an identity that you create for yourself. It's an identity that you discover. Your true identity as a child of God is not an identity that you attain. It's an identity that you awaken to. In other words, it's a pure gift from God to you. By the, the sheer fact of your existence, you are already a child of God, and you are already an image bearer of God. You are an, exp an expression and a reflection of God in finite form. And the invitation of the gospel is for you to simply step into that gift which is already yours, the gift that has already been given to you. Now, even though your identity as a child of God is very expansive, and it's very diverse, and there's a lot of things that we can say about who you are as a child of God. Part of what it means to step into your identity as a child of God is to step into peace. Because the New Testament says that God is the God of peace. In other words, peace is God's very essence. And you, because you are God's child, also have and share that same essence. God is peace, and in the same way, you are peace. Peace is your true self. Peace is your true nature. Peace is actually your natural state, which means that you are never more yourself. You are never more fully human than when you are at peace with yourself and at peace with other people. And that's actually what it means to be at peace with God, to be at peace with yourself and to be at peace with other people. When you are living out of sync with your true identity, when you're not operating out of your natural state of peace, life starts feeling very heavy and burdensome. And remember, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if you feel like you're carrying a heavy burden, come to me and you will find rest for your soul. And think about all the challenges that Jesus had to deal with. For him to say his yoke was easy, his burden was light. There was this lightheartedness to him. 
to think that even in those moments when people were saying negative things or trying to uh, label him and exclude him or be violent towards him, that he was able to still find rest in his soul? What is that? When you're not living in alignment with your true self, you don't feel that rest. You feel that sense of heaviness because when you're not in a state of peace, guess what? You're in a state of discontentment. And when you're in a state of discontentment, that means you are not happy with the present moment. So there's always something about the present moment that you have to change and that you have to adjust and that you have to critique. And you have just one judgment after the next judgment after the next judgment because that's what our minds love to do. That's right. That's wrong. That's good. That's bad. I like this, but I don't really like this. We always have an opinion to give. And those aren't bad. Those aren't bad at all. But you've got to check if all of that is coming from a place of peace or if it's coming from a place of discontentment. And I'm sure if you're honest with yourself, when we do a lot of that labeling and judging, this, this is good, this is bad, I like this, I don't like that, we always place ourselves on the good side, on the right side. And we always place everybody else on the bad side and on the wrong side. Isn't that how it works as human beings? So it's important for us to recognize our tendency to always be judging things. That's what your mind is for. Like your mind is a problem solver. It's always looking for problems and it's always trying to find solutions. The problem is most things that you think are a problem aren't really a problem. And if you don't keep your mind in check, it's just going to be in problem solving mode all day. And you're trying to solve a problem that nobody's asking you to solve. You're trying to fix somebody who doesn't even want to be fixed or who didn't even ask you to help fix them. And that's what we end up doing. And so part of what I have learned, well, the moment I started recognizing how judgmental I am, and it's okay for you to admit that, people. You know, the most important words I think that Jesus said are, do not judge. Oh, man, if we can drop the judgment, if we can drop just always having to share that opinion, always having to make that critique, if we can just save it for when we need it. <laughs> you will start noticing that life is so much smoother than you've been making it this whole time. Beneath all of those judgments are peace. And what you will notice is when you're not judging things all the time, you start recognizing very quickly that life itself has never been the problem. Our reaction to it is. And that's what all of the great mystics of every tradition, especially Christianity, have said. There are no problems in reality other than those that we create through our misjudgments and our misperceptions. In other words, beneath the commentary of our ego, life is always exactly what it needs to be. This is why so many great teachers have said that spiritual transformation is a lot more about unlearning than it is learning. We have to unlearn all of those negative belief patterns and negative thought patterns and programmed ways of thinking that we have uh, basically given ourselves to as a result of just soaking everything in. We have to learn how to see through all of those negative thinking patterns and limiting beliefs that are holding us back in order to see reality for what it truly is. We have to unlearn a lot of those bad habits instead of having to learn new things. A lot of people think the spiritual journey is about, I gotta learn more information, I've gotta learn more about this, I've gotta learn more about that, and there's a, that's a part of it, for sure. But let's talk about all the things you need to unlearn. Unlearning your aggressiveness, unlearn, unlearning your anger, unlearning your, your uh, tendency to always judge things very quickly, quickly, because beneath all of those judgments, again, there's peace. And the moment you can access that peace and begin to live in that state of peace, life begins to expand for you in a totally new way. So today, what I want to talk to you about is the art of practicing peace. Practicing peace. How can we practice peace in our daily lives? Look at what it says in this passage of Scripture in the book of Philippians. It says, The peace of God is much greater than the human mind can understand. This peace will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. The word guard in the Greek is a military word that was used to talk about what different militaries would do in order to protect a certain city from being invaded by outsiders. So the scriptures say that the peace of God is your protection. The peace of God is what guards you. What well, guards me from what? Guards me from the invasion of fear. 
It guards me and protects me from the invasion of worry. It guards me and protects me from the invasion of, of depression and anxiety and stress. And the way that it does that is by helping to give me clarity. Peace always brings clarity. Calmness always brings clarity. And when you have clarity, now you can see life as it is, which allows you to respond in a way that is appropriate and conducive to the situation at hand instead of just making things worse all the time. When I was in high school, I used to play basketball. And I wasn't that good, unfortunately, so I always sat on the bench. But there was one thing that I did really good, and that was, that was shoot threes. I was, I've always been good at shooting threes. I can't really do much else, but I can shoot the three and I can make it. And I was actually pretty good at doing that back then in the day. And so there would be times if we were up by like 20 <laughs> when the coach would put me in. I'm just kidding. No, but there would be other times where, you know, if we needed to knock down a three, coach would call on my number. I would go in and I'd, I'd try and knock the three, but I would get really nervous and anxious about it because I'm like, oh, my God, I got to make sure that I'm, I know why they're calling me in. It's to make this shot. So I got to make sure that I set myself up and I make this shot. But then I think so much about making the shot that I end up missing the shot. So... One day, I remember we were playing a game, and my, I had a great friend who would always give me this reminder. Anytime that it was time for me to go in the game, he would look at me. He was sitting right next to me. He was another uh, bench warmer, my fellow bench warmer. And he said, hey, man, he's like, you got this, man. Just remember, stay cool. That's what he always tell me. He's like, you got this, man. Just remember, stay cool. And that advice, I'm telling you, it went such a long way for me because everything about that environment that we were in when it was game time was not conducive to staying cool. In fact, all of the people in, in the bleachers were trying to do everything in their power to make sure that you did not stay cool and that you lost your cool. Instead, they would say some of the meanest things. They would talk about your mama. They would talk, I mean, and then, mind you, then you have the crazy parents that are in the crowd who do not care. You know, and they're just yelling and screaming and going mad. There was one time, this was the, the scariest situation where it was very hard for me to stay cool. We played a team in Miami. I forget what school it was. Maybe it was Gulliver Prep. I forget which school it was in Miami. But the team that we were playing, guess who was on this team? O.J. Simpson's son. So when we went to go play them, O.J. Simpson was there in the bleachers, all the way at the top. I got so nervous about that when I went in. His son fouled me, and I apologized to him. I said, dude, look, man, I don't want any problems, bro. I said, look, seriously, I'm not even kidding you. I went up for a layup. He, he hit me. I get to shoot the free throws. I'm like, dude, no, I'm sorry. I promise. I did not want to look at that guy in the face. And then everybody was, like, making a thing about it. But there are such things in life as distractions, things that will try and get you out of that place of calmness and peace. What do we do in those moments, right? And the people who have it the worst, NBA players, professional athletes. Let me show you some photos of the crazy things that people do while professional athletes are shooting their free throws. Okay, so this is LeBron James. LeBron, okay, this is before he won a championship. Very early on in his career, Braun became known as King James because he was such a dominant, he, he is such a dominant basketball player that he's known as King James. Well, somebody there from the Celtics in Boston decided to sit right in front of the basket so that when he shoots free throws, he could see, hey, buddy, you're a king without a ring. I just want to remind you, you're a king without a ring. And then they have that ugly face there. Look at this next one. Okay, so this guy, this would have been funny if you actually could see his face. This guy, his name's Paul Gasol. He used to play for the Lakers. And there's a, a, a photo there in the back of his face, okay, next to the face of a llama. And it says, separated at birth? Like, in other words, you ugly. Miss this free throw, please. You think he doesn't know that he looks like a llama? Why you got to remind him? It's so messed up. Look at the next one. This one's my personal favorite. This guy, his name was Tony Parker. And this is a picture of his ex-wife, Eva Longoria, who's a famous actress. Everybody knows her. That, that was his wife. He got divorced to her that summer. And here, somebody wanted to remind him, hey, look at your lady. Anything to distract you, literally. 
But if you were to watch these players in those moments, sometimes they chuckle, sometimes people get to them. But the, the, the real professionals, like the experts, the people who, who are the best of the best, you'll always notice it doesn't matter what is happening out there in the crowd. They have learned how to stay in their zone. They have learned how to stay connected. They are in their sweet spot. They have tunnel vision. And in those moments when everybody's trying to rile them, them up, they keep their cool and they stay calm. Why? Because they know that it's only by staying calm. It's only by keeping our cool that we will be effective. Because when you're in a calm state, that is when you are capable of maximizing your potential in every given moment. Why? Because peace brings clarity. Calmness brings clarity. The question is, how can we experience that peace? And the answer is probably not one that you want to hear. But I think the more we talk about this and the more you get used to it, the, the more peace you will experience in your life. The only way to access peace is through acceptance. Everybody say acceptance. acceptance. The only way to access peace is through acceptance. Look at this passage of scripture. In fact, I don't know if you'll consider this scripture, but I'm going to read it anyways. This is a book called uh, Ben Sirach, and it's from the Apocrypha. Okay, so in case you didn't know this, Christianity is very big and broad and diverse. Most of us come from uh, Protestant Christianity or evangelical Christianity. Uh, there's also a branch known as Eastern Orthodox Christianity. There's also an entire branch of Christianity known as Roman Catholicism. Well, Protestants don't have the Apocrypha in the Bible. The, the Apocryphal books were written in the intertestamental period. So between the last book of the Hebrew Scriptures and the first book of the New Testament, you have these writings that, that were written that were known as the Apocrypha. Protestants don't have these books in the Bible, and they don't uh, consider them to be inspired, just useful resources. However, other Christians do consider these texts to be sacred scripture. I'm quoting it today because we're pretty different here at Heartway Church, and it doesn't really matter who said it as long as what's being said is true, right? So here we go. First sentence. Accept whatever happens to you. Okay. <laughs> Even if you suffer humiliation, be patient. Gold is tested by fire and human character is tested in the furnace of humiliation. Trust the Lord and he will help you. Walk straight in his ways and put your hope in him. I really want to focus on that first line. Accept whatever happens to you. In other words, live your life with this open-hearted receptiveness. Accept what life brings your way. I was reading uh, a novel this week, and uh, this author was drawing a parallel uh, between this particular story that he was telling and the spiritual journey or the journey of the soul. And he says the, the journey of the soul is like a man who finds himself on a boat with no sail and no rudder in the middle of the ocean, equipped only with his harp. In other words, when it comes to life, we may not know where we are, where we're going, what's coming next. We really realize that we don't have much control about anything. But regardless of where this journey is going to take me up or down, good or bad, I'm going to be singing the whole time. I'm going to be celebrating the whole time. I'm going to enjoy the ride the whole time. That's what acceptance looks like. Acceptance is us being able to say, this is what life is requiring of me in this moment, and so I'm going to do what I know that I need to do, and I'm going to do it willingly. Willingly. It's an open-hearted acceptance. Whatever comes my way, I embrace it. I don't resist it. Why? Because any time you try and resist anything that comes your way, all that's going to do is bring you pain and suffering. Notice Pay attention to how you react when you think that your past should be different than what it was. When you look back in your past and you say, man, I can't, and we even say this, I can't believe this is happening to me. Or I can't believe, I refuse to believe that this is happening to me. That's suffering. And that's normal. And that's okay, right? And we feel like that. But as long as you stay there, you're, you're going to stay stuck, Think about 
what happens, the stress that you feel, the anxiety that you feel when you think this present moment, this person, this situation needs to be something other than what it is right now in this moment. What happens is we end up becoming people that we really don't want to become. We act so out of alignment with ourselves that we have to go back after some time and say, I'm so sorry, that wasn't me. I don't know what I was thinking. I know, you didn't know what you were either. Because from that moment, we moved out of peace into resistance. Not able to accept what life brings our way. Look at this passage of scripture in the book of Job. It says, agree with God and be at peace. In this way, good will come to you. Very simple. Agree with God and be at peace. Well, what does it mean to agree with God? To agree with God is to agree with life. Because God is the author of life. Which means that I should embrace life in all of its complexity, in all of its paradox, with all of its ups and downs and issues and trials and turmoils and tribulations. Why? Because it is in that It is in the mess, it is in the difficulty, it is in the trial, it is in the suffering that God is to be found. The scriptures say that God's ways are higher than our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So life may not be going my way, but I can trust that God will always have his way. And his way is good. His way is perfect. His way is better than any other way that I could have ever imagined for myself. I may not be able to wrap my mind around what's happening in this situation. It doesn't make sense. Life doesn't seem fair. I don't get why this person is able to have so much success and I'm not. I don't get why this person did this to me and why I'm always having to go through these issues over and over and over again. I may not be able to wrap my mind around it. But I can trust that everything is always lining up in my favor. Why? Because God is always working in and through every situation to bring about the highest possible good. See, I don't know if it would be the wisest thing to say that God predetermines everything or predestines everything in our life. But I do know that God is so wise. God is so good at integrating and bringing together every aspect of our lives so perfectly into the divine tapestry that I live my life as if he did. I live my life in a surrender. I'm flowing. I'm not in control here. So I surrender to God's providence. And I do that by allowing things to be what they are. I surrender to God's wisdom. And I do that by letting life unfold in the way that it unfolds and not trying to question it and change it and critique it, but seeing the gift in it, seeing the gift in every present moment, seeing grace as it's coming to me through my challenges, through my struggles, through my pain, through my issues. It's acceptance, open-hearted acceptance. In the scriptures, Paul oftentimes draws a parallel between the spiritual life and the life of athletes. If you read in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, you'll, you'll see this parallel that he draws. It's like, this, in order to, to take steps forward in the spiritual life, look at, look at the way athletes live their life. You know, they have a goal. They have a prize. Ours is, ours is much better than those perishable things, Paul says. Because we have, we have our eyes on something much bigger. But he says, look at the devotion. Look at the discipline. Look at the dedication. Look at the time that's put in. In fact, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 34, it says this very simply. Seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. In other words, practice peace. Pursue peace. Make that your greatest desire. Make that your highest goal. How do you do that? Two ways that I want to leave you with today. Very simple. Very simple, but I think it's practical, and if we do this in our everyday life, we will begin to see things change and be transformed. How can I seek peace? How can I pursue peace so that I can remain in a state of peace and be the most effective for God, for my family, for myself? Two ways. Number one, by setting your intention. And number two, by listening to your intuition. The first, setting your intention. What is your intention in life? If you aren't being intentional about the kind of life that you're living and the energy that you're bringing into every moment and situation, that's already one easy way to move yourself out of peace and into frustration. What is your intention? 
and how different would things begin to look? How much would things shift in your life if you made peace your intention? An intention is a goal, an aim, an objective. What is my goal today? (laughs) What is my aim today? What is my objective today? My goal today is to be at peace. Because when I can be at peace with myself, that's when I will be at peace with others. And when I'm at peace with others, that's when the world becomes a better place. And so I know I'm going to come across a lot of difficult people today. And I know that there's going to be a whole bunch of things that frustrate me and get me mad. And I'm going to want to react in a whole bunch of different kind of ways. I'm going to want to say what I need to say. I'm going to want to put my foot down. I'm going to want to put people in their place. But I, I just take some time to notice. And if I notice that these reactions are coming from a place of fear or insecurity, if it's not coming from that deep well of peace that is within me, from my true nature, from my true essence, I let that go. I hand that over to God. And I know that seems very hard at first. At first, it's like I got to bite my tongue, right? Eventually, it's like, no, it's it's not hard to do this anymore. Why? Because at least what I've noticed is when, when peace is your goal, winning is not important anymore. When, when peace is your aim and your objective in every moment, being right isn't important anymore. It just doesn't matter that much anymore. Being right? For what? Is that the goal? For many of us, that is the goal. And be honest about that. My intention in this interaction is to be right. My intention in this interaction is to win. And you're, gonna, and you're probably really good at it, too. But at what cost does that come? It comes at the cost of your peace. I mean, this is the advice people gave me when I got married. And I laugh about it, and it's a joke. But it is true. You could either be right or you could be happy. Which one are you going to choose? Being right is, gosh, yeah. I, I mean, I have so many examples. I'm not even going to start with how I do this in my relationship, because I always, and I mean, I've had two moments this week, two moments this week where I, with Emily, I feel I judge her because I think she always wants to be right. She just wants to have the last word. And it's like God smacks me in the face. It's like, hello, that's you. You're always the one that has to have the last word. You're always the one that has to win. You're always the one. And I'm like, gosh, geez. You know, it's like, it hits you where it hurts, but it's, it's, it's good to recognize those tendencies in yourself. Because guess what? That allows me now, next time we have an interaction, say, what is my goal? What is my aim? It's peace. When peace is your aim and peace is your goal and peace is your intention, guess what? Understanding life doesn't become that important anymore either. Because if you try and understand it, if you try and wrap your mind around those things that don't make any sense because they're not supposed to make sense, yeah, your life probably has not been fair. Trying to wrap your mind around that isn't going to do much for you. When peace is your goal, trying to wrap your mind around it is just isn't that important anymore. So you let go of all of the things that don't matter, and you kind of start carrying yourself with a sense of carelessness. But it's not really like a carelessness in a bad way, it's like a good kind of carelessness. I don't care about none of this stuff because I care about one thing that matters more than anything, and that's staying connected. Staying connected. How do we stay connected? Through mindfulness, paying attention to your feelings. Any time that you are suffering, any time that you are experiencing frustration, or irritation or anger, in that moment, you can be 100% sure that your ego is trying to force its agenda. Your mind is trying to solve the problem. And in that moment, when you're looking at things through the filter of your ego, you are not looking at things through the clarity of inner peace. And so that's what I remind myself. In this moment of frustration and anger, I know, I'm sure there is some truth to what I'm saying, and I am seeing something that is legitimate. But I'm also communicating this in a way that's probably biased, in a way that's probably not helpful, in a way that's probably going to make the situation worse. And so you allow that to be your indicator and your signal to come back to yourself. Anytime you're suffering, anytime you're you're out of peace and in a state of discontentment, that's your alarm. Oh, I've got some work to do. There are some mental knots in here that I need to untangle myself from because I can keep trying to go down this road, but what is it going to do for me? 
At what cost is that going to come? So you begin every day by setting your intention. And you have to do this daily. Peace is my goal today. The other day, the way I said it to myself is peace is my only goal today. Like, really? That's the only thing that matters. It's staying connected. And this is why Jesus described the kingdom of heaven as a treasure. Once you find the kingdom within you, you have found a treasure more valuable than anything. And you're willing to sell all of your possessions to go and buy that entire field where you can get that one treasure because you see the value of it. Do you see the value of peace? I know you do. I know you long for it, but you're trying to get there in ways that will never get you there. The only way to access peace is through acceptance, through surrender. So where am I offering resistance in this moment and keeping myself from peace? Let me tell you something. Nobody can take your peace. Nobody can. Peace is what you are. That's why I started by saying that. Peace is your very essence. Peace is your natural state. Nobody can take your peace from you. You either choose to remain in peace or you choose to step out of peace. Well, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, remain in me, abide in me, and you will produce much fruit. To abide, to make our home with Christ within, with the Spirit within, to abide in peace. That is what spiritual practice is. This is, we, we are all here because we want peace, we want joy, which is what the scriptures say the kingdom of God is all about. The kingdom of God in the book of Romans says it's not a matter of food or drink, it's not a matter of talk, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. We're all here because we desire that. Well, the only way that you will have it is when you seek it and you pursue it as your number one aim and goal and objective in life. And guess what? There's nothing you have to do to get the peace. You already have it. What you need to do is let go of all the stuff you're trying to do yourself. You see the paradox? That's why we use the word grace in Christianity. It, it, we're, we're living in grace. We're flowing with grace. It's all a gift. It's all a gift. There's beauty all around us all the time. God is speaking to us all around us all the time, in and through every situation. Everything that happens to us is, is shaping us and forming us and transforming us in, in a powerful way. It's just that our eyes are closed. We're not open to seeing it because we don't want the wisdom and we don't want the truth to come to us in the way that it's coming to us. But what other ways are going to come to you besides your pain and your suffering? That's, just, that's the human predicament. That's how it is. That's how it works. So you start by setting your intention. Peace is my goal. Peace is my goal. And you remind yourself of that in those moments when you're tempted to step out of peace. And then the second part that is just as important is listening to your intuition. Listening to your intuition. We use that word intuition now a lot, which is why I'm using that word. It's not a word that's found in scripture. However, the, the, the concept is found in the pages of scripture. Our intuition can be thought of as the indwelling spirit, the inner wisdom of God, the inner guidance of God, that still small voice of God that speaks in, uh, on the inside of us. Your intuition is your heart your soul, what would it look like for you to listen more to that voice, that voice of inner wisdom, that voice of truth, the voice of God, the voice of the spirit within you, instead of the voices of fear and anxiety and depression and insecurity that are always trying to invade your mind? The, the way you listen more is by getting quiet more. Getting quiet more. One of the mystics, Rumi, said, the soul has been given ears to hear things that the mind cannot understand. And, that, and that's where so much of the pain comes from from us. I'm trying to understand that. I just got let go. How does that make sense? I mean, I did everything I know to do. This person, oh, my God, I gave myself to them. I gave, I gave myself all of them. I've done everything I know how to do. They still betray me. They still hurt me. How does this make sense? I can't wrap my mind around it. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. 
the soul has been given ears to hear things that the mind cannot understand. Sometimes, you know what I've been practicing? I've been telling my mind, thank you for your services. I don't need you right now. <laughs> really? I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to devote myself to overthinking or to thinking and solving problems when I need to. But when I don't need to, I don't need to. If I've been sitting around for three hours thinking about the same thing repetitively over and over and over again, if I, if I become aware of that, what I do now is I say, okay, all right, this is on hyperdrive. I can't control it. Let me just hit the pause button for a second. Let me go do something that is like, go do yoga or something. I don't know what it is. Whatever you want, honestly. That's what my wife and I have been doing late, lately with Raf and Vidal. And Holly, you went the other day, right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be. You go work out. Go take a walk in nature. Walk your dog. Spend time with your kids. Do something that can get you out of your mind. There's uh, one quote by uh, a Zen teacher who says, stop thinking and end all of your problems now. <laughs> It'll be, I mean, yeah. You know, but when, you, when you're able to get to that place of stillness, that's when, that's when the downloads come. That's when the revelation comes. That's when, that's when clarity comes. That's what you need, right? Clarity, because all you're seeing is a fog in this moment. I need clarity. Uh, there's another teacher who says, a quiet mind is more important than a positive mind. Think about that. Everybody's always trying to, we got to be positive. And I love positivity. Positivity is better than negativity. <laughs> okay, so be positive. Sure, if you, you know. Don't try too hard. Don't be fake. You know, but being positive is good. But a quiet mind is so much more important than a positive mind. Why? Because a quiet mind is clear. A quiet mind is a clear mind. A quiet mind is an open mind. A quiet mind is a humble mind. It's a beginner's mind. A quiet mind goes with the flow. And from that state of openness and calmness and peace and receptivity, that's when the peace of God can begin to be channeled in you and through you. And that's when you begin to experience life in a totally new way. Let me pray for you. Father, this morning I know there are so many of us who are overthinking so much. And we desire peace and we long for peace, but peace seems to be so far away from us. Help us to recognize, God, that the solution to our confusion and the solution uh, to, to our stress and our turmoil and our discontentment isn't changing anything externally. It's changing things internally. And really quickly, I'll interrupt this prayer because this thought came to me. You don't need to control your thoughts. What's important is that your thoughts don't control you. That's what's important. And so, Father, in this moment, I pray that you would help us, God, to see through the, the illusion of our negative thinking patterns, the belief systems that we've developed over time that are blocking us from seeing the beauty of life as it is that are preventing us from being able to see the kingdom of heaven among us and within us and around us. Life is, life is always beautiful, and you're always doing a good thing, even in the dark, even in the mess. That's the, whole, that's the whole thing. It's learning how to see the light in the darkness. It's learning how to find the joy in the pain, and that only comes through acceptance. So, God, in this moment, we choose acceptance. We choose surrender. Whatever comes our way, whatever challenges we may be facing. We will speak the same words over our soul that Jesus spoke into the storm. Peace, be still. And in that stillness, God, we know we will find you. We know we will find clarity. We know we will find everything we need to be everything it is we were created to be. Thank you, Father, for giving us this peace, the peace through which the scriptures say we can overcome the world. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you guys for joining us. Love you tremendously. Have a great rest of the week. We'll catch you next weekend.